Today we're going to be going over uh, sharpening and uh, it's a really complex uh, process. There's a lot of information. I'm trying to keep it a little simple uh, but because of all the sharpening stuff and uh, how long it takes to really you know, get consistently good at it, uh, it's one of the reasons why I suggest that beginners start with a disposable blade system uh, like uh, the Hobby Blades, uh, X-Acto knives, Stanley makes them. A lot of different brands make a decent one uh, and you can buy a cartridge of blades and um, that way you also know what uh, a sharp knife is supposed to feel like. They don't make as large of a cut, but um, it basically can make as nice of a cut as uh, you know the best sharpened knife. Okay, so first I'm going to show you guys um, what an unsharpened knife looks like. There's all kinds of different um, states of being, you know, needing to sharpen a knife um, from upkeeping, you know, the knife with the stropping, and then there's uh, damaged chips, and then uh, some knives come. Uh, not really ready to to go blade. You can see here I've made a cut with a crappy knife, and you can see those little those little kind of bumps and stuff. And you see when I do it with a properly sharpened knife, there's nothing there. It's completely smooth and almost a little bit reflective. Uh, and besides the feel of a knife, you can see there just a little bit. There's a little bit in those shadows. You see those little dots and crap on there. Little tiny tear outs that are happening. Um, from little chips in the blade again, and just because it's not sharp enough, it's not to separating the wood grains like it should. Again, uh, this is a cross grain, and then with the uh, properly sharpened knife, um, it just smooth, it goes through there, through there, real smooth. Um, it's it's hard to show you guys some of this stuff. It's so small, and just the lighting, and um, again, there's also the feel of, uh, and you know, the, how nice it is, and uh, more functional to use a, a sharp blade. So, looking at it from, you know, the front, which is going to be, we're going to call that the profile of the blade, it's basically like this on the tip, that's what we're looking for, right? Uh, now, some blades, uh, a lot of the companies still go with the old tradition of giving you a blade that comes not really quite ready to use. They, they give it to you like this. The sides aren't flat, they're beveled, but then it has another secondary beveled on the front, which is generally too steep for most people. Everybody has their own preference on, on bevels and, uh, and how steep they like it. Generally, you're going to need to go about double up where that first bevel is, the secondary, and then uh, make a straight line from the point to there. Some uh, knives go from the bevel from the spine all the way from the back, and some have a flat spot, like the one on the right that I just drew. Uh, like flex, flex cuts in Mora knives have a little flat spot, and then their bevel starts. Uh, there really is no good or bad way. It depends on the size of the knife and uh, also your preference. Um, so, again, yeah, even companies like File um, and uh, apparently Stubai, a lot of these guys, and they'll make their gouges and chisels will come ready to use, um, but their uh, knives won't really be because, um, again, it, just because they leave it up to preference, um, it's easier to change a, a chisel or gouge kind of the way the bevel is than it is a knife, basically. So, um, that's something you gotta you gotta get used to sometimes, but you only have to do it once, you know. Set it. So here we go. We're gonna look at the, it's kind of a three quarters of what the blade looks like, and this is what happens is there's a bunch of little the edge starts to become kind of basically crappy after a while, and then it's gonna leave these little traces and lines. That's like what you saw when I used the the dull knife. Um, a lot of times it's not just dull; it does get rounded over after a lot of use, but um, generally there's little microchips that come out. <laughs> microchips. There's microchips in your knife. Uh, no, um, there's these little tiny like chunks that come out of the tip of the blade. Sometimes you can see them, sometimes you can't. Um, and they basically start to make a, a blunt knife because they have little flat surfaces on them. Um, so whether it's a factory dull knife or uh, it's happened from time or the knife fell or the ground the wrong way. Anyway, whatever the damage is or problem, you have to make the, the new point that you're going to make on the knife uh, when you grind down it, it has to be behind all the damage. Um, if it's not, if there's a flat spot, say, this is completely dull, then even if you bring it back and you spend all this time working on it, and you have this beautiful looking knife, if, if on a microscopic scale it's still flat, you didn't bring it back far enough, you're, it's still going to perform exactly the same as if you had a butter knife or had a, no, no bevel at all on it. So you, have, that's, you make sure that you get a burr on it. And we'll talk about that more later. I'm going to show it to you. Uh, I got some pretty good video footage. You can kind of see what's going on. Um, basically, when you're taking off all this wood, like what I'm doing here, you come back, so you have a new point. There's going to be... Um, the, the steel's going to get so thin 
that um, it's not going to get ground off. It's going to move to the side. Basically, it gets to a certain point that it turns into tin foil. Um, tin foil is, um, you know, it's flexible and it can be torn with your hands because it's so thin. If it was made out of, of thicker um, casting or however they make it, then it wouldn't bend at a certain thickness. Okay, it's just like paper is to trees or whatever you want to compare it to. Steel also bends at a certain thinness. So that's what happens, and it and it makes a burr. It's going to be a bigger, thicker burr on the rougher grits, and as you work your way down, um, it's going to get smaller and smaller. So whatever stone or um, sharpening device, sandpaper that you use, you have to get that um, the bevel that has the tip on it has to be flat on there. Okay, if it's if it's not and the tip's up, you're you're basically doing nothing. You're punching at the air. Um, you're not ever going to get it sharpened. If it's too far forward, and I mean even in the slightest, it's going to take the edge off and it's going to be too steep. And then once you flip it over and do the same mistake probably, um, then it's going to be even more steep because it's going to be doubled up. And because of that, if you want, you can plan to make your bevel a little bit more steep than you think it should be. And then if you uh, if you do screw up a little bit, uh, or if you have a little bit of a curved bevel, in the end it will uh, still be a, a steep enough to make a good cut. Okay, so most knives, like this one, the Deep Woods Ventures, it comes sharp, ready to use, and it has an overall bevel that's flat. So when you set it on there, just like you saw me do, it's stable. It kind of has its own built-in sharpening jig. Um, on other knives, um, they maybe don't come like that because they have a, they're more thin, but like say this one this is one of my knives that I made. I haven't properly reset the bell in a long time and it rolls. You see that? So in order for me to sharpen the edge, I have to hold my wrist and elbow and everything more steady in order to keep a little micro bevel on there. I don't know if it's really a micro bevel, but just a flat edge. You know, maybe it's only a millimeter, but that's not enough to really rest it on. When you have a knife like the Deep Woods Ventures uh, or a Mora knife, where it has a really big bevel, um, it really, you can just set it on there and it's much easier to do. Why this one's rounded over is because um, I'm a very violent carver. I have a lot you know, not much patience. So I chip the blade a lot and I don't want to take all that steel back like I was showing you and I just end up uh, making the bevel steeper. You can still get a, get a good cut out of a steep bevel if you have a proper edge on it. So when, if you have to round it or if it's um, you're setting your bevel for the first time you really just have to kind of stick with it. Um, but in the rougher grits when you're in that stage try to get a bevel set so that it's not as hard and, and, and to kind of have something to rely on um, this one it, okay so if it's curved which you shouldn't be carving that much with a curved knife but um, you just lift it up a little bit and that'll follow um, keep it straight basically I mean not straight but um, that'll keep it at the same angle the bevel all the way around if it's curved a lot like this one where on the tip it's basically um, facing another direction you have to turn your wrist a little bit too while you pick it up it's a little confusing um, so maybe don't start with these knives um, but yeah it's, it's curved so much that um, if you just took pulled it up it would be facing one direction you'd slice your um, your strop or uh, it may dig into your uh, Japanese water stone you don't want to do any of that so just turn it a little bit while you're uh, turning it while you lift. Okay, so let's talk about your options and products um, for sharpening. Um, I I was just I bought so much crap when I started wood carving. It's ridiculous. Um, you always think it's going to be better, or whatever. Really not going to make a difference. We got Japanese water stone here. We got a bunch of different Arkansas stones, um, uh, and um, I don't know synthetic made stones. I have some carborundum stones and all these other things. Um, basically, most of the stones, I'm um, going to use an oil, and the oils are not real hard to get made. I have some Norton oil here. I've used a few different brands. doesn't seem to really matter a whole lot. Usually, if it was an oil one, you, you coat the whole thing, and, um, you know, you just start going on it. They're not a bad option. Um, they don't go real high in grit. Um, and most of the ones that you buy um, are going to be real crappy. Like from the hardware store, if you have one laying around your house, it's probably way too high of a grit. Um, you really need to go, you know, get like a decent one. Um, this one was not a bad deal. I think they still sell it over at Woodcraft. It's a nice large stone. Um, 
and um, it's got it was like a double sided one too. Um, it these are going to be the same um, same technique for the most part as uh, the Japanese water stones, um, except the Japanese water stones um, they lose their shape a lot quicker. They maybe also because they lose material faster. They um, they also maybe cut a little faster. It's hard to say, but like you have to have. Um, they have to soak in the water for a little bit, and then you have to have something to keep them wet while you're carving. And um, if you do that in your kitchen, and it's like they're they're also uh, like really really expensive, especially do large ones. And when you get up into the the grits, I mean, it's like outrageous. And um, so you have to have a stone that will like flatten them. Anyway, the the oil you wipe off with um, you know a paper towel. And uh, I just wipe the blade off. You generally wipe the blade off in between grits, but also you wouldn't want to get the oil on the water stone because water and oil don't mix, and it kind of screw up the stone, the stone a bit. Um, they are good. The Japanese water stones, for a long time, up until recently, uh, were the best sharpening technology and almost the only real sharpening that there was um, for for a lot of uh, human history. And um, I mean, the guys in in America were sharpening stuff with files. Um, it's just just um, atrocious, and um, so it 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 still has a lot of weight in in people's minds for um, how good they are. But uh, industry and technology has gotten to a point that we can um, make things that are um, as good, if not better, than the water stones, and, and for the most part, um, they're they're easier to use. And uh, specifically, um, uh, this is the diamond technology. I just have a few small ones. These are specifically from the company DMT, uh, but there's more and more companies that are making um, quality diamond sharpening products. Um, I'm going to start here on a. Uh, this is you know they kind of have a color scale that goes with the grits. And uh, I forget what this blue one is. It's like a 320, 250, something like that. Um, it's called Rough. Um, and uh, I they have a lot of products that go a lot uh, rougher than this. Uh, I'm not really sure what people use them for because these are these things are extremely fast. And um, I mean, this one's it's it's just very rough as the description is. But um, they have like three more, four more um, roughness. Uh, scales after before this um, and and they don't seem to sell as many of the uh, finer grits um, they do have them and that's um, I'm not sure if the other companies go up to the same grits that they do so that's kind of one of the reasons why I've used them um, but they also have these smaller products um, which are cheaper it's one of the reasons also why I use them they're easier to clean so you just use water and a paper towel to clean it off um, and then maybe once a year you go do a in-depth cleaning with um, some SOS powder and a wire brush. Um, they also have a break-in period. Um, I, I had read reviews about people who didn't know about this and they thought it stopped working after a few times and it's actually just kind of get, getting going. Um, but yeah, when you first get them, I think the, uh, it, it, uh, they're a little bit more aggressive and, um, and they're maybe not as uh, flat. <clears throat> but after, the, after a few uses, they really start uh, getting consistent. And I've had these for quite a few years, and they've been really great. I enjoy them. So you can see that bevel is already just from a little bit of work. It's already getting uh, scratched up and flattened. Um, this this bevel, this knife was a serious mess. Okay, so um, I try to get some close-up shots here. I get them a little better later on. Try to show you the uh, uh, just from doing that. We've already started to get a little bit of a bevel, and also um, we started to develop a little bit of a burr. You can see it kind of when it twists. It's on the bottom and on the tip at this point. So. Um, I do have to do a little bit of uh, off-camera sharpening. I'm sorry. Um, for the rest of the video, I'll just speed it up if it's uh, if I'm gonna have it all in there, because um, it is to get you know it's good to get a, an idea of, of how much time it really does you need to spend you know consistently sharpening on each stage, and uh, and then you can see after a little more the bird started to form. Um, it was all the way across, so that means um, and you want to make sure the bird is on all of it. Um, because it, it will be, um, it can be inconsistent, and um, you got to straighten it back out. Make sure the tip is uh, pointy on all of it. You know, the rest of the steps are going to be a little bit of a waste if you don't get it right in the beginning. And uh, so we're going to go on to the next, um, I think this is the 600 grit. Um, the grits are kind of on anything. You take them with a bit of salt because um, 
they uh, they get filled with stuff, and after they've been used for a while, they maybe get a little bit finer, and um, and so it's kind of always a toss up. You just kind of have to kind of feel for it. Um, they are a good, you know, rule of thumb to go by, but um, whatever. So I'll go a little bit on this red one, but then I remember that um, I kind of wanted to show you um the sandpaper a little bit because um, this is one of my other favorite modern technologies in sharpening. Yeah, I mean, I'll I'll pedal sandpaper all day long. People just don't believe it. It's like the hobby knives. They want to spend a bunch of money. They don't like the cheap throwaway solution. But uh, sandpaper is perhaps the best. Um, because it, um, the grit kind of sacrifices itself, um, which it also does fill up faster. Um, it, it's able to sharpen even more aggressively than anything. You need to get a high-quality sandpaper. Um, but really, the high-quality brand names are really going to be the only ones that make uh, higher grits as well. They're going to be the only ones that can uh, have the capacity to go up to uh, 1,500 and higher. And um, not all places sell these. So go and get a, you know uh, some of the packs of the 600, 800, uh, 1,000, 15. And if there's anything higher, grab that. And um, you can start your doing great sharpening right from there. But most of you won't. You'll want to spend a bunch of money online, so I'd suggest going to the diamonds after that. Um, the, so it does fill up faster, the sandpaper, and um, that also means you can kind of go up to the next few grits um, just staying in one spot. So you kind of keep uh, moving and then go back to the, your used spot and then stay on that spot and it'll polish it up quite a bit. Let me show you uh, how, how nice this got this knife. So at this point, I was like, what is in my light here? What's going on when I was trying to shoot this? And it was, of course, one of my cats, as usual. They always got to make an appearance. Somebody does in one of the videos. And um, you know, so we got a really good shot here of, uh, look, you can see the burr great, happening great. You can see that it's got a nice flat, that last uh, sandpaper. Look at this little piece of burr that fell off. It looks like a little hair. You see that little metal piece I just played with? And you can see the burr that's happening on there. So some of it can flake off in pieces like that. In the old days, they called them wires, but uh, since we can look at it in macro things, you can see that it's sheets, actually. So anyway, sandpaper's awesome. It's the end of the story. And it's not really the end of the story because uh, after looking at that, I was like, you know, this really needs to come down more. The whole thing needs to be flatter. Um, the blade is just in such awful shape. Even by the end of this whole video, there's still some issues. Um, because some of it's like got like concave because of when I was learning how to sharpen again. Um, on, on a power tool, by the way. So, um, basically... Even if there's concave parts, what really matters is the last little part on the tip. If that if that's flat and it's all sharp, then it, everything's fine. And it, and also the you know the proof is in the pudding at the end of the day. It doesn't matter what your blade looks like if it's cutting well and there's no tear outs, then you're pretty much good to go. Um, because I mean I have a lot of blades that you could look at in the light and it would look pretty bad and um. You know, I mean, you just have to, you're really worried about something that's on a micro level. So if you're getting that done, then there's nothing else to worry about. We're in wood carving here. We're not, we're not cutting pieces of paper or shaving our arms, which by the way, in those videos when people do all that stuff, they're doing that with a burr. Okay. They're developing that burr and that burr is actually very sharp. It's not very strong, but it's really sharp and it can cut things like arm hair and pieces of paper. And it's specifically actually on a side note. That's how um, the old straight razors used to work, is they would develop a really thick burr, and then they would strop and sharpen that burr, and that's how they would shave their face. And that's kind of what these guys are doing. Besides shaving their legs with the burr, um, they, you, if you're not cutting wood and seeing it, you'd have no idea if parts of it aren't you know, incredibly sharp or properly sharpened. Um, and okay, we're going to look at this blade again uh, in the light after I did some more work with the sandpaper. Um, and you can also, you can see, you can still see the burr there, kind of, um, a little bit of the shots there. You can also see that just the whole blade's looking a lot more flat, and, um, it's getting a much better, like, bevel, and, uh, I just wanted to make sure to do that, because there was some issues, it just wasn't consistent enough, it was such, just such a weird shape, this, uh, blade. So, also, down by, like, the base of the blade, you're not really going to be able to get there. There's going to be issues sometimes, so you just kind of go as far as you can. If you can't get there on the sharpening stone or the sandpaper, then you're not going to get there carving either, so keep that in mind. Just jam the knife on there as far as it'll go and start going. Uh, on the note of sandpaper, there's also uh, some 
other new technologies. It uh, by, goes by a few different names. Kind of forget some of them. It's like micro mesh, micro sandpaper, uh, super fine sandpaper, whatever. Um, it's basically it's like these sheets. You can see them here. Um, some come in larger sheets, and it's basically they they go from really high grit to like crazy high grits. Basically, um, they go super high, and uh, they kind they start uh, measuring in microns, which they do have a translation, but uh, uh, the grits start getting in such high numbers it gets a little ridiculous. So these are these are another thing. Um, and these are, if you have uh, are you going from stones that don't go very high or the, it's you know sandpaper you couldn't find stuff. Uh, this is a great way to go kind of in between uh, the the sharpening and the strop. Um, it may not be necessary, but um, they, some some of these I guess really could uh, replace the strop. Um, you could get a, get enough of a polish on there. Yeah, uh, kind of kind of depends on um, which ones they are and, and what the micron size is. But um, it's something worth checking out. It's something that's cheap. These are mostly used up, but um, it'll it'll uh, polish up quite quite a bit of the blade. Um, but again, these are all in very high grit, so you you have to go to, you have to have something before these. Okay, so we're kind of skipping around here from different products, but um, it's okay. Anyway, uh, we're, so we're going on to the 1200. I think this is the uh, quote fine. Uh, the green of the DMT products and um, I'm start working on this uh, that by this level you can barely feel that it's like doing anything but when you look at it you can see that it changes it but by the time you get to the next step it's like it doesn't feel like a grid at all um, but that's what's supposed to be happening again really where the the good sharpening happens is on a, a very small level so you're not gonna feel a lot of dragging um, and if you wanted to call this a file, I guess you could. It's a diamond file, and there's, you know, sandpaper is kind of a file, but um, it's just so funny what some people's ideas of sharpening is. I don't know. Mine was pretty bad too, and I did a lot of stupid things when I was learning how to wood carve. I, uh, you know, bought into a lot of the um, things online. Um, you know, people got excited about sharpening at the bottom of a coffee cup because it's ceramic. Oh my God. I did a lot of stupid stuff, and you can see how many products that I've bought, um, you know, over time because I thought some were better than others. Whatever, it really doesn't matter. Just get some and learn how to sharpen. It took me a long time to learn how to sharpen properly. Um, I don't have a lot of patience, and I don't have a very steady hand, which don't go well with sharpening. I think another problem is that so much of it happens on um, a level that we can't see. That it's like. Um, you know, we're just not, we don't do that. We do, you know, we, we only believe what we can see. We don't mess around with stuff. I mean, it's basically like weird, you know, voodoo to uh, do sharpening stuff. You might as well uh, be trying to practice some metaphysical stuff here uh, because, you know, you really can't feel it or see it. And um, eventually, after your brain will learn to uh, trust this and understand it, and it will start to model something that's happening when you're going to these higher grits. <clears throat> And uh, being consistent with it, but I remember it's a, it was a huge problem. Um, yeah, I, yeah. Also, just knowing, it, understanding how hard it is to sharpen. And I don't know. I it, I talk to guys who start carving, and I, some guys have really picked it up easily. Um, it kind of depends on your temperament again, like I said, and also your background. So don't don't take it too hard on yourself, though. It takes a while. Okay, and let's look at the blade uh, after the 1200 grit, or whatever it is. Uh, you can see that it's uh, looking pretty good, starting to get really shiny. And then you can still see a little trace of a burr there. Um, it maybe doesn't look like the burr has gotten a lot smaller, but it has. Um, it's just kind of a blurry reflection when you're seeing that thing on the tip there. But Also, the blade in real life looks much smoother than it does here. It looks The whole thing looks like a mess, looks like a... Caribbean steel drum or something. It's all kinds of angles, but um, the the tip's good. Okay, it's flat there. Anyway, no, it looks really scratchy, but it's actually this is and this is magnified. You wouldn't be able to see that close to your eyes. All right, so next step is the DMT uh, tan stone, quote unquote stone, um, and this is an eight thousand grit, pretty high up there. And uh, this is a good in between step, though. Um, I go from this to the uh, the strop, but you could probably have an in-between step. It'd be better. Uh, you'll see because I just sharpened this knife. It came from pretty far. Um, that 
it'll take me a while on this drop. And um, if I'd had it in between step, it would have been quicker. So we're just taking our time and um, working on this last grit. Um, yeah, uh, so just some other things about sharpening. Um, these blades, um, steel in general, is flexible. Uh, that's why it's so special. Is it doesn't bend and stay bent. It goes back into position. And um, just the, uh, these are pretty thin. You may not be able to feel it, but just pressing down a little bit on uh, a sharpening stone, it'll bend the knife a little bit. And that causes problems on in flatness. So you really don't push too hard at all. And I put my, my finger on the blade um, so I can feel that it's uh, flat and also like help guide it. But it is a little sketchy, you know, I'd, I'd feel that out first. Um, and not all blades work that way, you know, you can't really do that, so it's up to you. I, I, I've cut myself really badly quite a few times, either during sharpening or right after sharpening. Um, I'm not really sure why. You know, the old timers always say that, um, a sharp knife is a safe knife. And I know it's like a fun thing to say, and I understand their, what they're trying to say, but... It's not really, a sh it's not safe. These things are crazy. Like with a no regular kitchen knife, most of the knives people have sitting around their house, like you probably hit your arm with it and be fine, you know? Like, these knives are freaking sharp. They hopefully should be. And, um, you'll cut the crap out of yourself um, without a whole lot of effort. Generally, it's not going to be, you know, mortal danger, um, but... Once you start putting your arm strength into cuts, then, then there is. Um, so don't use arm strength when you're wood carving. Anyway, um, so yeah, don't press down too much in any direction because it's going to bend the blade. And also, I, I wipe it off with a you know paper towel so I can see what's actually going on. And there's like a little weird burr thing. I'm not sure if it's actually a piece of paper towel that's caught on a burr or it's actually a little burr that's hanging off. Yeah, that's what I was messing with on there. Um, but yeah, when you're doing all this, you want to look at it under light. If you have a magnifying glass, do that. If you don't, you know, use a camera and you can get in there closer. And you'll see things that you can't normally see and it'll maybe help you understand and identify problems um, with sharpening. Help it be a little less frustrating. Um, if you're like me and you just, you know, think you're going to be lucky the first time, you know, then after a month of banging your head against it and you haven't quit, then go get a magnifying glass and some light. Uh, so I'm just working on this a little bit more now. You really want to have like a zen, you know, state of mind when you're doing sharpening. Um, it does not help anything if you're rushed or if you're being too aggressive. So... Just relax, and after you get this right a few times, you will you won't have any problems. You'll know what the payoff is. Okay, so let's take a look at this blade here. It's hard to tell the difference from last time, probably. Uh, you can see the burr is just about non-existent. Um, it may be the lighting, but there is still some there, I promise. Um, but it's starting to just look like there's a bunch of little tiny scratches on there, or it's like frosting or linear little directional stuff. And uh, that's about what it should look like at this stage. At really, okay, in real life, this is, um, without the camera magnification and strange lighting, um, this looks like oh, just about ready to go. Um, it, it looks pretty shiny. And now, it's time to strop. Alright. So, stropping. You get yourself some leather. And uh, maybe connect it to some wood using some epoxy. You get to, get to sharpening. What I'm doing right here is I'm using the the spine of the knife, the back of the blade. Don't ever use the tip. Uh, and I'm scraping off excess dropping juice from uh, previous sessions. And uh, you want to do that because you want there to be leather that's uh, applying and kind of, I don't know. That's what does the stropping and it's aided by uh, the... Uh, whatever viscous material the strop is made out of as well as the grit inside the strop um, so you want it you want it to be on leather you don't want to be on a bunch of juicy stuff and uh, so this is from deep wood ventures as you saw me showing off the thing you see it has these little uh, 
indents a hoof print in there. I've been using this. I like don't want to ruin the hoof print because it's so cute. It's got such great packaging. Um, this is a great strop, by the way. Um, I haven't been real happy with a lot of strops, um, stropping compounds, excuse me. Um, and don't use the ones from Home Depot. These crayons, these buffing crayons, they're crap. They're full of jewelry and other stuff that's not heat treated steel. Um, so, yeah, I get this from Deep Woods Ventures. Um, and if you really absolutely have to, then get the Flex Cut Gold crayon. Um, those two are basically my favorites, uh, about the only ones that are okay at all. And um, I've put way too much on here, but uh, it's okay. I'm going to be stropping for a while. And um, I don't know. I haven't figured out yet how to like really do get it to be spread around without putting too much on. So I just kind of like go for it and then um, do it a little bit and then scrape it off and then do go some more. Um, I don't know. Anyway, about on strops, you can get you can get a strop itself from um, Deep Woods Ventures. He sells a nice one. Um, if you make one yourself, you can get leather from. Sometimes I see it at craft stores. They'll have these scrap bags, and you gotta get the leather that's like super trashy. It's like really thick and it's like dry and gross. And sometimes you can see a brand in it still. That's the good stuff, not the suede stuff, not the oiled soft stuff. None of that. It's gotta be like super rough. Um, it maybe you can use an old belt if you have a legitimate old belt, but you shouldn't probably waste it on that. Um, just get a real strop from somebody. You can write me if you really need to. Uh, I have some extra leather still, so. Um, yeah, they're pretty cheap, though. Just buy a nice-looking one. I mean, look at how ugly mine is. Anyway, so stropping, you can only go one direction. And you want to be even lighter when you're stropping because, um, you know, we were talking about this, how it needs to be flat on there. Well, with, with the leather, because it's not hard, um, the blade can sink down, and then that kind of wake that it leaves behind is going to be pushing up against the edge of the knife and it will round it over and all your hard work will be gone will be for not um, so also I'm going really fast because I've been doing a long time you want to make sure when you set it down that you're not hitting the tip and when you're lifting it up you're lifting it up before the end and not spine first the whole thing you want it to be flat and you just gotta go slow in the beginning. Um, this is kind of a short strop, so maybe that doesn't help. But I generally do very short, as you've seen, um, sharpening, because I, I had a hard time in, with the straight lines um, with keeping the, the blade flat. So I, that's why I do like a lot of the up and down and diagonals, and I never do circles because that's just horrendous for me. Um, so I just keep short things. As a as a saw sharpener, an old guy once said, you set your elbow and get to work. So I was saying there should have been a stage in between my uh, 8000 and the strop. Um, because I check it here in a second. Anyway, the uh, Deep Woods Ventures actually sells... So this is called Pale, you see on the thing? He has a dark one, and that's actually a, a coarser grit. So that could have been my in-between stage as well. He has a two-stage dropping compound. Um, so maybe just get that. So look, you can see here there's still a little bit of bevel, like the burr on there. See, it's a tiny little bit. Not happy with that. Okay, so we have to speed this up. This thing is half an hour already. 35 minutes is ridiculous. Um, but for the most part, hopefully you guys get the idea of how long it takes to uh, properly sharpen a blade um, from basically scratch. Um, most of the time you're not going to be spending as much time, especially stropping. Um, it, it only takes a minute to do the stropping. Um, you just keep keep it up um, every 20 minutes 30 minutes of use on each tool depends on the wood if it's a green wood or some types of wood they'll fill up uh, the blade faster I think on a micro level that uh, tiny bits get caught in there and the stropping will remove it um, so it's not really this whole sharpening process um, and it really does help I hope you guys have gotten um, a decent understanding of uh, sharpening a knife uh, if you have any questions or problems uh, feel free to email me or contact me anyway and uh, take some pictures of your blade send them over and I can try to give you some suggestions um, you can send your tools to somebody if you uh, get desperate though okay and let's take one more look at this knife up close um, you can see there's still 
what we're used to deep scratches are now light ones um, halfway up the blade there uh, but I'm not really worried about that again it's really the end uh, the very tip that matters um, you only need about an eighth of an inch it's really polished up good uh, but hopefully if you have a good uh, strong bevel on there to guide your sharpening um, then it'll be more than that so you can see this is pretty good I, I really I can see all these like little tiny scratches um, they're actually probably kind of deep since I've mirror polished it. Okay, so you can put it up something like your thumbnail or this. You see, you can see how clear that mirror is on the bottom part. So you really want to get a good mirror finish on it that uh, you can see with the naked eye. When it's magnified, there may be, like you just saw in mine, some kind of basic scratch looking things, but it's more like, um, you know, micro scratches on a disc uh, CD. Um, so anyway, I went back to the strop again because right at the base there was a little bit of a burr left that was bothering me. It was like kind of sunken in so it wasn't getting hit. Uh, so I got it on the edge of that uh, strop to get it off. Alright, so now we're going to test this bad boy in drum roll. This is a piece of crap knife, but um, it was made with decent steel. So it'll be good now that I've totally reset the bevel. And uh, boy, it's barely in the shot there. Can't you see how nice that is? <laughs> I'm such an idiot. Okay, there it is. Uh, look at that. Beautiful. No little chunks out or scratches. There's one you can actually see. See that? Almost reflective. Nice and smooth. Yeah, if you see any little like uh, lighter lines that get dragged through that, that's uh, you got to go back and you have to go back through all the steps if they're not too bad, but you know, do a few. And then if you want to get really good with sharpening, then you do cross grain on the basswood, and um, that's when you know your knife is really ready. Is when so okay, and then also test all of the length of the knife because um, that's kind of the whole point because you're going to be using it all. Use the tip, use the middle, use the end. You can do it in one stroke, but um, you really want to see if there's any little lines on there, and feel also if it's um biting into the wood or if it's sliding along or um, starting to uh, dive out and uh, there you can see I mean you can see the difference between the, the carved wood and the fresh knife and the other wood okay we're gonna do one more shot uh, up close under the light um, so you can really see these cuts a little better you see that they really are a bit reflective and um, that's as smooth as wood is ever gonna get and you can see underneath there, these kind of lines. Uh, you can see it. that's the grain, though. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to like, get it in focus, and so you can see it. There's a little bit of spalting in this basswood. See that? It's kind of funky. Yeah, you can see there. There's no uh, vertical lines at all. All right. So I hope you guys learned something. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. And uh, be safe. And uh, happy carving.